I think uh, we have uh, some network issue. I think that home is uh, dealing with. So uh, let me take this opportunity to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Sotiropoulos uh, in the uh, International Igniting Minds uh, lecture series. Uh, we are extremely thankful to, to Dr. Sotiropoulos that he agreed uh, to become part of this uh, lecture series. And most importantly, he also accepted our request to uh, deliver the session on such an important and pertinent topic in the current perspective, and that is entrepreneurship uh, in the law. So before uh, I hand over the session to Dr. Sotiropoulos, uh, allow me to introduce uh, him to all of you. Uh, just uh, a minute. Yeah. So Dr. Chris Sotiropoulos uh, is currently the uh, director and CEO of Global Opportunities Commercialization Private Limited. He's also the director of APAC Health Private Limited, as well as the principal of legal and international commercial services. Dr. Sotiropoulos is a global thought leader in the field of commercialization across the globe specifically its application to the nation capacity building and peace building to improve quality of life. He has over 25 years ex expertise in global commercialization of innovation, uh, innovative healthcare, IT products and services, facilitating licensing and distribution across several market segments between listed and private companies in the US, Europe, Australia and Asia. As director and CEO, of Global Opportunities Commercialization. He is part of a multidisciplinary team of global thought leaders that leverage networks around the globe for trade, fundraising, commercialization, youth and women empowerment training, peace building, and nation capacity building. GOC currently has projects across uh, several continents in the commercial and social enterprises. This year, he has presented on issue of nation capacity building programs for many industries to diverse forums and nations, including Afghanistan for climate change, Nigeria for IT clusters, India for digital education and startup mindset, Australia for artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence, Somalia, peace building training of parliamentarians and tribes, and South Korea for health innovations. In the healthcare sector, he has introduced medicines for the treatment of sleep disorders, rare diseases and completed licensing deals over US uh, $300 million in value. He is also practicing lawyer, focusing on international trade and commercial law transactions, assisting clients to quickly grow their business, develop strategy and implement corporate restructure for global expansion in US, Europe, Africa and Asia. His knowledge of commercial practices and business mindset across disparate markets enables more pragmatic advice, drafting and negotiation, and reducing grievances due to cultural misalignment. We are extremely thankful for Dr. Soritopoulos uh, uh, that uh, he uh, took uh, time out of his busy schedule uh, to ignite the minds of our uh, budding lawyers. And I'm also uh, thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Anup Saroop, uh, it's because of his recommendation we could uh, have uh, Dr. Sotiropoulos in this uh, lecture series. So, uh, sir, uh, over to you, please. Thank you very much. First of all, hello to everyone. Um, thank you immensely for the opportunity to speak as part of the titled program, which is extremely provocative, uh, International Igniting Minds Lecture Series which is a, a wonderful topic thought of through the School of Law to capture the essence of what it is that is trying to be communicated and, and indeed to embed into the knowledge set of students, staff. Thanks also to moderator, Mr. Pathak, Chancellor Sri Hari Mohan Gupta, Pro Vice Chancellor Sri Abhishek Mohan Gupta, Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. Anup Swarup, the Dean of Faculty of Law Professor Dr. Yogenda Shirivastava, and Assistant Professor of Management Mr. Abhishek Kumar Jain. Let's start with the presentation. 
entrepreneurship yeah. and the what we can see from this first slide is not just a wonderful photo I took uh, many years ago during my uh, commercial travels, but an image that reflects the law within a social context. Straight lines, pillars, curved lines, illustrations of innovation and colour. It's the combination of society and life yet operating within particular rule sets which the law imposes on us. The presentation will be divided into a number of themes. The entrepreneurial mindset, the legal interface, guidance that's needed, generational legal trends and why it's important to understand that, territorial legal imbalance, transformative shock events, which we're in the middle of one at the moment, global and local issues, as well as philosophy. So let's start with the entrepreneur mindset. Hence, we have a very colourful slide because these individuals are extremely colourful. They are visioneers. They see things that a lot of us don't see. They have a very strong self-belief. On the other side of the slide, BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals. Their goals seem impossible to us. They self-validate their mindset and their beliefs. They're unshakable, even when they're absolutely wrong. They're abstract thinkers. They experience a burning passion. It's almost, I've described it as a pre-anger moment, not that it's an aggressive activity, but it's a passionate and we're going to make this work. I don't care about the obstacles, that sort of moment. On the bottom left of this slide, you see the statement, bicycle for our minds. Now, if this were an interactive presentation, I would ask the audience, who came up with that? Steve Jobs, the Apple founder. He said, I want technology or my technology to enable people to use it as they would bicycles to travel from point A to point B. Breaking the current status on the bottom right. Now, who said that? Richard Branson, the founder of the Virgin Group of Companies. What was his annoyance? Why should we be paying so much for these services when the model should be totally broken apart like a Rubik's Cube, totally, and then put together in a way to enable more people to use the services. So this is the mindset of an entrepreneur. And if we as lawyers don't understand that, we're in for a, a big shock. But when we do, we can hold their hand and guide them as they move through their life of challenges, ups and downs, global expansions, challenging of, of intellectual property and to success. Here's to the crazy one. So this slide, I think, captures brilliantly what an entrepreneur is. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers. You see images of Einstein, Dylan, Martin Luther King, I think it's Richard Branson, the chap who invented the light bulb, Muhammad Ali, Gandhi, Alfred Hitchcock, Maria Callas. And it's worth reading on to infuse their energy. The round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no request for the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, 
about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. This ad was created for Steve Jobs. It's called Think Differently when Apple was almost bankrupt. And one of my dear friends, Peter Economides, met with Steve Jobs at this time. And what did he say? He said, I spent hours with Steve Jobs barefoot in his home. We didn't discuss computers. We discussed bicycles. We discussed people being able to do things. That's the sort of people they are. That's why this presentation, and it's worth accessing online the actual advertisement to see the emotion and the energy of the mindset of an entrepreneur. And this is why Apple was able to reconfigure how personal computers and devices are used by all of us today. The entrepreneur law interface. I love this image. What does it say to me and hopefully to you? It says you want to get from point A to point B, look at all the twists and turns you have to go through. Goodness me, couldn't, you know, if we were lawyers, you'd say, well, just build a bridge from point A to point B. Done. That's not how it works. The entrepreneur law interface is extremely important. Why? There are three core realities. The entrepreneur's objectives. Then there's the legal pathway. And then there's the lawyer's ingenuity. Let's not forget that. Some will call it the craftiness of the lawyers, but it's not. It's the lawyer being able to utilise an understanding of the rules, what has an opportunity to be expanded, what areas you will not be able to expand and how you may use different parts of your environment for the entrepreneur's benefit. Now, this is multidimensional because we're looking at what is the current status of policy, law, uh, international corporate structures, finance models, tax structures, where to raise money, where not to raise money. Emerging trends, which we'll look at in this presentation because as law students, that's part of what you need to do. As academics, oh yes, very important as well. Policy makers, they look at this all the time. National interest of a nation, such as India, looks at this all the time in the context of a global moving platform. And then we have transformative shock events. This obviously came about due to COVID, but is not only due to COVID because there have been other transformative events which have impacted how the entrepreneur and law interface each other. Entrepreneurs need guidance, lots of guidance. And my advice to all lawyers is that you must be close at all times to the entrepreneur. I can't tell you the number of times I've had entrepreneurs call me up and say, oh, Chris, I've just got this letter or we've just done this experiment and we've had a side effect. What do we do? You're kidding me. Why don't you come and speak to me and your other advisors prior to during this activity. We can then guide risk, guide how you should do things, and by having a commercial mindset as well, where you should go, where you should not go. And the entrepreneur needs honesty. And that's where a good lawyer with good values and virtues and that touches on my last slide, 
second last, is really important and you have long lasting relationships. So what are the typical issues? Management of IP. When do you register if you've got a patent? There's a defined monopoly period. You've got to know, well, I don't want to patent or file a patent application now if I need another several months, six months, 12 months, 18 months before anything really becomes solid. I'm losing that time in my 20-year term. What is the global strategy? How do I deal with markets, major markets? For example, China. We hear many stories about China's IP management and it is improving. We also hear about squatting, whereby a lot of individuals and small firms will take your brand name that you have allocated for a product you're developing and register it in China even before your product is ready for launch. Goodness me, you want to enter a global, well, a, a mass market, the sign of China, and someone else has got the name. Major issue. So we're told often, as soon as you come up with a name, best to register it in China, ASAP, before it becomes public. Incorporation. What format for what stage? Businesses, startups have traditional options and paths. It could be 20 or 30 different paths, but there are paths. You need good lawyers that understand the paths, understand what you want to do as an entrepreneur, but also ask questions. Oh, do you see? If you're developing something in India, do you see that you're going to focus on the American market, on the European market, on the African market? So how should the structures be developed? Should you set down small local structures, local pillars? And then how does your global expansion work? I've taken companies globally where we'd have to sit down and say, all right, where is your manufacturing? Where is your R&D? Where is your marketing? How do you service clients in Europe? Do we need tax haven uh, shelter companies, shelf companies? How's that considered by companies that you are trading with if they're operating out of London or US? And that has a significant impact. So you need to be really careful about that. Taxation benefits and other benefit considerations for shareholders are also extremely important. On the people side, hiring, firing, advisory, compensation design, common sense statements. Again, I can't tell you the number of times companies have started up lean, bootstrapping, not having lots of money and saying to someone who's going to design the website or even someone who's going to provide some legal services, oh, I can't pay for your services, but I'll give you some equity. Three years down the track, you've got investors who want to come in and put in 10, 20, 30, 100 million dollars. And they say, oh, you've got these what they call rats and mice shareholders, really minor shareholders. They can cause lots of problems. Get rid of them. Buy them out. That is a big headache. And some investors will say, well, I don't really want to get involved with this 30 shareholders. I want two because we want to ramp up activities, be focused, not be caught up by what one or two small shareholders say. And that's extremely important as well. So commercial agreements, how you enter, how you exit. I've been involved with a few fast accelerating companies where they were distributing medicines around the world for rare diseases. And because the company, when it started, was bootstrapping, the agreements it had with these uh, owners of these medicines around the world was 
such that should there be a significant shareholding change in the distributor company, then these innovator companies, the licensors, have the rights to cancel the agreement due to a change in control provision. Well, that sounded great when it was being crafted and the company was operating out of someone's residence or a small office. But when turnover was $100 million and an investor came in and said, right, I want to buy 60% and I'll pay you X big X dollars, but I don't want to lose those contracts because they're the lucrative contracts. The licensor said, well, we have the right to, uh, to exit this agreement and or renegotiate. And that was a major headache for the uh, acquirers of significant shares because guess what? The terms and the margins changed. And for several moments towards the end of that transaction, it looked as though the deal was going to be off the table. But who would have known? The benefit of hindsight, of course, is that you advise your client be careful. We want to be involved in the commercial drafting because if you get it wrong at this stage, you could be in a lot of trouble later on. Liability during development products and in different markets is a big issue. In some instances, there's even indirect liability cover whereby Let's just say your product, for some reason, causes loss. Okay, fantastic. Not fantastic, but it is what it is. Indirect liability and indemnity could mean that you're not only paying for replacing the damage caused, but also damage to reputation, loss of clients, loss of market share. We have to be very careful about some of these causes. So that goes to the contract law. Shareholder registry, entry and exit discussions, but also shareholders agreement. At what stage should a shareholders agreement contain what level of control for founders versus non-founders? What happens when you have two or three founders and one of the founders passes away? Then you have the, is it the founder's partner? Would be it husband or wife, who then controls one third of the business? What if he or she has no understanding of the business, never did, maybe was the wife or husband of the technical person? Now, that's a significant risk to the business moving forward, continuing, growing, providing confidence for customers. That needs very careful drafting. Fundraising, the when and the where, public versus private and exit strategy. You'll find that significant investors often have very specific rules as to what they will invest in and what the exit strategy will be, public capital raise, etc. If your lawyers aren't aware of that because you don't have a foresight discussion six years out on a best case, worst case scenario, then you could be in a bit of trouble. It is very common to use lawyers, have a selection of lawyers, the lawyers who are experts in intellectual property, property liability, international advisors and lawyers. So different jurisdictions, you'd have a suite of lawyers from uh, EU or US or China covering specific needs. And that is extremely important because if somebody said to me as an Australian registered lawyer, can you please provide legal advice for um, some very technical issues in Europe, I'd say, well, no, I can't because I might not be able to do so under my registration, but also there might be specific nuances in that part of the world which I'm not aware of. And I certainly wouldn't be doing that in China. This is um, an interesting slide which seeks to invoke 
what an entrepreneur would see as emerging opportunities. So on the left column, we have legislation, the middle impact, and on the right, opportunity. And no doubt you have seen this in your market in the last six months. Legislation. So in Victoria, we have the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. Along comes COVID. Along comes the state of emergency. All of a sudden, it's, well, should I be tested for COVID? I have no symptoms. I certainly have no fever. I'm feeling okay. But should I be tested? Police stop me on the road. Should I be tested? The Human Rights Charter says no. What about the lockdown? We've had curfews imposed. What time you're not allowed to be out in the evening unless there are you fit into the exemptions? What time in the morning? Likewise, we have geographical limits. How are these tested? That's a legal mindset. Then. You've got the opportunity mindset, which says, lockdown, fantastic. I've got a delivery business. I'm going to be able to do very, very well. Um, online learning, guess what? Our children have not attended school, so therefore they've had delivery of their learning online. And, boy, hasn't that been a roller coaster? We hear lots of experiences from extremely good to, my goodness me, I'm a parent, and guess what? I've had to help three kids at home running and each one's got to have a computer, got to have good Wi-Fi, and I'm teaching more than I thought I would and I have no idea how to manage my kids' opportunities. Zoom. How good has Zoom and GoToMeeting and WebEx, how good have they been during this time? Online shopping. We've seen boom sales in retailers. That's what the entrepreneur thinks about. Environmental Protection Act, 2017, another Victorian, Australian piece of legislation. Management of waste. One of the big changes is no longer do, let's just say you're painting your house and you've got some paint left over. No longer do you just pour it down the local drain, put it in the rubbish bin. Nope. You have to dispose of it at a particular site authorised by your municipal council. Now, this law was delayed because of COVID, but what a great opportunity for people involved in new recycling services. What a great opportunity for whether it's university researchers or startup companies who are looking for paint, wasted paint, to say, oh, we've got a way to extract A, B and C from these sources, if we can pick it up for free because people are disposing it, if we have a free collection service, then guess what? We can then commercialise our business. The FDA Food Safety Modernisation Act, Food and Drug Administration, hence the US legislation, preventing food contamination, not just managing the contamination. So therefore, You've got diagnostic technologies, boom time. Re-imagining, not re-imaging, of the supply chain, boom time. Because now everyone's worried about the effect of contamination. And lawyers, especially in the US, love um, liability action in this space. So it enables entrepreneurs to go forth and come up with New solutions. This is an interesting one. Next one, the Homelessness Reduction Act. Only the UK could come up with a beautiful name like that. To tackle homelessness and a term I'd never heard of, rough sleeping. That's a, a nice way to say people who sleep out in the street, which is a terrible thing. What does that provide for? New category of caring services. And we've seen internationally the growth of social enterprises in the last four or five years and the growth will continue and will be reflected in India as well. Fantastic opportunity for new category of caring services. So what 
is the message from this slide. Legislation can provide for particular impact, but it provide enabling opportunities for entrepreneurs. Now, when I was thinking about how, well, what sort of issues I, I would like to convey in this presentation, I went back to my days at law school. And they were wonderful days. And one of the first discussions we had was what are the generational legal trends? And I came in as a mature age student, having been a practicing microbiologist and an academic at one of our local universities. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting question. How critical is this in this presentation? The equitable doctrine and common law has expanded substantially in the last decades and will continue its trajectory of expansion. Why? We've been, we, we have moved away from the feudal system. We've moved away from the system of working as master and servant. We've been given property rights. With that comes disposable income. And the beginning of the last century, society was very much a need society. My tractor has broken. I need to find parts to replace it. My clothes cannot be mended. I need to attend a store and purchase just what I need. Well, where has that gone now? Oh, there, there are sales on. Well, that's great. Um, I think I want to go and have a look. I don't need a pair of pants. I want a pair of pants. And the magazines tell me if I'm not wearing the latest fashions, maybe I'm not so cool. So we've become a consumerist culture. And I won't discuss the virtues or otherwise of that conduct. We've also been able to borrow and mortgage. So all of a sudden, we're handling financial transactions. We are involved in commerce. We are starting small businesses. And certainly in countries where migrants have played a significant part, Australia, parts of Europe, US, the country almost has been built on the back of these families that have come from desperation and with lack of language, with lack of knowledge and experience, with lack, lack of networks, they have worked hard, two, three jobs, started a business, limited language skills, borrowed money, limited language skills, conducted transactions, limited language skills. Now, the Lord doesn't just sit back and say, well, that's fine, we don't care. It says, no, 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 hang on a minute. That's society. We need to work with, within society because we are an institutional pillar of society. So now there are consumer credit laws. There are minimum protections. In Australia, if someone wishes to borrow money for personal reasons or for commercial reasons, a solicitor certificate needs to be signed by the legal representative of the borrower, and that's imposed by the banks and the courts because what does that mean? That means that a solicitor, a lawyer, has provided guidance as to what these 50, 100, 200 page legally drafted clauses mean and what the risk is to the borrower. So that's where that was going. Now, things are moving faster in some areas. Generation Z. I'm losing track of what happens after Z. Their commerce mentality in relation to terms and conditions is almost negligible. 
how many times have they, probably including myself as a guilty party and others, received on your phone, uh, uh, we're going to update your terms and services, do you agree? Uh, we have an updated version of this software. Uh, you must uh, tick the box to say that you agree. If you don't tick the box, you don't get the update. Great. You can read through the X pages. 99.999% never read it. It's always an accept. On the bottom left is a very interesting scenario. So Twitter, a lot of its customers were noticing that then when they were sending out their daily messages, and I'm not a Twitter user, they noticed that a number of people say, oh, I didn't get that tweet. Oh, I didn't get that one either. Oh, I didn't get why I didn't get that one either. And then Twitter had to modify its terms of service. So if you look at its terms of service, they've added that they have the right to limit distribution or visibility of any content on the service. This was not there beforehand. And even a lot of people now who use Twitter would not know that. But that was an example of, of them being embarrassed and shamed into what they were doing and having to modify their terms of service. We know the importance of online shopping. And again, most people, and I mean 99% plus, do not read the terms and conditions. They might ask a little bit about, oh, what's the return policy? But that's about it. Well, that's not good enough for legal institutions. There must be protections. And these are particularly challenging when the transactions are international. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a growth in commerce. And, and let's disregard this trans, transformative shock event of COVID. There will continue to be a growth in commerce. So legislative and common law will adjust. International commerce is growing and there are calls for platforms to be modified all the time. Now, maritime law has had the benefit of a long heritage. So although there is status quo, they don't have as much difficulty and emergence of new issues as some of the other areas. So the World Intellectual Property Organization, so-called WIPO, has been a godsend in many respects. And I think it's great. But it's not global and it still has fragmentation. So international legal treaties, we're aware of those. They also need to be modernised for the technology world. Free trade agreements, well, we've seen how they have um, emerged and will continue to emerge in coming decades. And the last one's an interesting one, developing countries adopting international rules. Now, I've given some um, training to large corporates in, shall we say, two countries that were in the lower developing nation status but moving up. And they had rules, for example, that when they were selling their products to the local uh, pubs and nightclubs, that the sales representative would sit down and have drinks, share a number of drinks with the patron of that facility, and that would be part of the, the, the way that business is done. Well, as international rules became adopted in that country, they were told, sorry, drinking and driving on the job, not going to happen. And they said, but you've got to be kidding. That's how, that's part of the sales process. They said, sorry, we're adopting international trends and World Health, Health Organization relationships, and therefore we need to reconfigure how we conduct our affairs. Now, there is a legal imbalance, though. There are pressure points for entrepreneurs and their lawyers. What sort of pressure points? Financial transactions. Conducting financial transactions across countries that have maybe lower rules, countries where money laundering 
is a problem, countries where terrorism is a problem, obviously not a case in India, but in other parts of the world, it is. And we're doing business in some parts of the world where the first question we have to ask is, hang on, how does money come in and out of your country when we have no formal links with your country? IP management, copying, rip-offs, we know that that exists in many, many countries and compliance or chasing them up is almost impossible because of the institutions as well, including, sadly, the legal institutions that do not impose protections and respect for intellectual property. Data housing. Well, that's a big one. When we talk about, where's your data? It's in the cloud. Oh, yes, but but where's that? Oh, I don't know. In the cloud. Yes, but that's a figurative term. What shouldn't uh, data be held within the country's jurisdiction? And in fact, in many instances, it is a legal requirement. Insurance. That has significant impact when dealing with significant technologies in different parts of the world. And there are imposed trade restrictions, which is a nightmare for entrepreneurs. But the earlier they know about it, the earlier they can reconfigure relationships. Geopolitics, a reality which I certainly was not formally trained as a law student in this area, but is a reality which we all live with. And one of the things I would impose on all law students is that you spend a lot of time just listening to international media, finding out what's going on in geopolitics. I know the culture of, the, of India is a lot more entrenched in this sort of conversation than uh, other cultures. You must know when entrepreneurs say, oh, um, we're going to do a deal with Iran and we're going to take part of their technology and we're going to sell it to America because we're going to wrap it around our technology and it's wonderful, etc." No. Or we're going to sell it into Russia because Russia has X problems in this space Um, But we're also going to set up a company in the U.S. and we're going to get funding from the U.S., maybe a list on NASDAQ, um, and conduct some trade with Russia. Well, problems there as well. China. We know through TikTok how America and China are tackling that type of transaction. QA, again. If you're part of the 5G rollout and you have a partnership with them, guess what? The value of your business has dropped X percent because US, Australia and other countries are not using their services in particular areas. Although from my understanding, India is looking to develop its own 5G network and providers, which is brilliant. Executive orders. Who would have known that a president or an officer in the office of the president is able to execute executive orders which can impose tariffs, which can have significant impacts on commercial development. The Magnitsky Act as well, chasing individuals and their holdings around the world international sanctions and tariffs. Now, we've seen that come and go exists in several markets. There's subsidies, there's tariffs, there's uh, sanctions which keep being imposed on particular countries. And then there's also taxation. We hear about tax havens and we hear about jurisdictions looking to impose taxes on digital transactions. And then you have the economic fight back from the originators of these technologies. So these are elements of a reality 
which a lawyer needs to understand and to inform an entrepreneur should an entrepreneur be thinking about expanding uh, to these troublesome areas. Now, does a lawyer need to be an expert in this space? No. But it needs, he or she needs to be able to hint at a strategy or even when insurance is being sought to say, hang on a second, do you realise, you know, trying to cover insurance for COVID if you're in, in air travel, big issues there. All right, transformative shock events. We've talked about that. I have the images of three. 9-11, which was such a long time ago, you think, oh, what, what impact has that had on entrepreneurship and the law? Well, the Patriot Act, the deliberate imposition on our privacy around the world as a result of increased surveillance. So what did that mean? Well, if you're developing surveillance technology, you're in for a big time. Wars that were started as a result of this event. Terrible, absolutely, death of millions, suffering of tens of millions as well. But if you're in the defence area, lots of opportunities there. If you're in the humanitarian aid area, lots of opportunities there. And we're moving now up from 9-11 to 2016 November. The transformative impact of the Republican win of both upper house, lower house and the presidency and how the country and the institutions have changed and how the impact on international agreements, on tariffs, has changed substantially as a result of this, the incumbent presidency. Then, of course, we move to the devastation caused, causing, and will continue to cause through the pandemic. The change in conduct. We, in in Melbourne, Australia, were asked with one of our partner charities, when would you like to come back to a face-to-face lunch meeting? And we would have a lunch meeting every week. October, November, December, January, February, a lot of people selected February, which is telling because people have to travel into the city for this event and that means public transport, congestion, risk of disease, concern. So the legal impact and legislative and common law impact has been felt, certainly in your country, certainly in your state, certainly around the world. Phenomenal opportunities for entrepreneurs. The online learning opportunities, the telehealth, health via IT opportunities, the delivery, the unfortunately substantial rise in mental health Challenges means solutions are needed. How aged care facilities are managed, needed to be uh, evolved, and entrepreneurship has the role there. So it comes in two phases. There's what I call the phase one in the fog of the moment where we're all confused, we're all not sure, we're all waiting on the media, we're all waiting on what the health minister, what The Prime Minister will say what is happening overseas. We're not sure. Some of us have psychological trauma as a result. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen to small businesses that have been closed for six months? Young families that have mortgaged themselves to the hilt. 
What are they going to do? What's their tomorrow look like? These are real issues. And I've used the word fog because it is a fog. We can't see beyond certain distance. And then there's the phase two, the new norm. What is the new normal? I've got the two contrasts here. Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, possibly known to many of you, a true globalist through and through. And then we've got the Honourable Prime Minister of India, Sri Modi, who says, right, we have an opportunity here. We've realised that the international global supply chain, that is, when things are not so good for us, we can expect help from the global supply chain, didn't work very well. People were withholding medicines, PPE equipment, ventilator equipment, intellectual property. Well, we're not going to pass it on to you, India, because we've got our own concern. That is a reality. Therefore, national interest changes, and we've seen the five pillars. This, I think, is fantastic for India. Legal pathways are needed, though, and they will come. If they haven't come already, they will continue trickling in because changes need to be done to enable entrepreneurs who currently live in a very fragmented patchwork environment to create a sustainable supply chain with maybe 20 or 30 parts where investors can invest in confidence, customers can, can in confidence expect products within a time frame, the uh, development and the regulatory assessment can be quick, confident and provide confidence to the customers. But you've also got infrastructure changes that need to be made, technologically driven arrangements, a vibrant demography, which I think is a brilliant pillar. So a vibrant demography which sources allows source of energy for a self-reliant India. Demand, where strength of our demand and supply chain should be utilised to full capacity. These are wonderful pillars from which the country will grow substantially. Going back to Klaus Schwab, this is a time to reflect, reimagine and reset our world because he has seen what even lack of transport, air transport, it has a significant impact and nations saying, well, hang on a minute, this is not working for us and for our citizens. We need to reconfigure. And this will lead to a better uh, form of globalisation and it will lead to also a better form of quality of life and service for the Indian population and necessarily the legal pathway that's associated with that. So the reset will impact on globalisation. However, it's not as simple as, that's wonderful, let's throw out a few policies. There are local sovereignty law versus global issues. So the self-reliance model still needs global treaties to be modified, to capture and enable. What about the balance? Where is the balance? We're looking for a balance here between local sovereign law and global international treaties. Now, when you're dealing with like-minded com uh, countries, it's, it's easy. When you're dealing with non-like-minded countries, where maybe the rule of law or the practice of democracy is substantially different, then you have other challenges. What I'm seeing is that countries like Australia, and our, I know our Prime Minister is very close, has a lot of respect 
in deep respect for your Prime Minister, Modi. So therefore, in I foresee a model whereby Australia will say, okay, in we should have a closer relationship with India politically, economically, culturally, two-way, so that in times of need, we're not just hiding in our shell. We have three or four or five or six countries where we operate almost as neighbours to say, do you have a challenge in this area? Fantastic. We'll uh, increase our manufacturing supply to help you out. Uh, do you need what, – what do you need? So that still needs to be codified in law. Reset between the entrepreneur and the lawyer. This is a boom time for India. Millions of legal trans uh, transactions coming. So the local supply chain needs to be resilient. Uh, Multi-stakeholder supply chain management. There's a significant role for education and entrepreneurship to work together. But there are still oops, local and global issues which can be managed within the current context and the next decade. So we still have wealth disparity. Now, that's not something we can just hide under, sweep under the carpet. Human rights, dignity and caring. Now, India has a very caring culture compared to other cultures because of its heritage. That's a great opportunity for India to, to showcase and lead the world in this area. Climate change clearly needs international cooperation, but we're seeing elements of that starting and it will roll and, and expand over time. So there are challenges and opportunities for lawyers, entrepreneurs, national and international institutions during this time. Now, the last slide is one which is of prime importance to me and I know is in the heart of the Indian legal fraternity and law students as well. You've always got a question, the philosophy of the law. What is the right action to undertake? Now, is that the right question? One of my entrepreneur clients tomorrow week said to me, that's not the right question. I said, oh, my God, what is the right question? What should we be doing? Let's assume we have a, cl a clean slate. What should we be doing? What protections should we provide? We be providing in the law or encouraging through common law? What is the necessary for our country and citizens? The answers to these questions will empower entrepreneurs to come up with a raft of new solutions moving forward. In closing, thank you for the opportunity. You have here an image of our Supreme Court of Victoria in, uh, in Melbourne, um, a wonderful evening shot. We wish you all the very best of success. And, and I say to the academics as well as the students, that you are the guides for your country and the world. So thank you very much. So uh, I'm extremely thankful, uh, Dr. Chris, uh, for uh, uh, you know delivering this presentation in such a systematic way. Uh, because uh, uh, your opening of the session reminded me of one of the uh, elective courses that I used to teach on entrepreneurship. And there was a similarity. Uh, where I used to begin with a quote of a columnist, Steve Blank, who said that uh, entrepreneurs are crazy, and that is a good thing. So uh, I'm really thankful that you began in that way. And in the middle of your presentation, the way you systematically correlated with the legal changes that are taking place and entrepreneurial opportunities that one can seek was uh, very fabulous. And uh, the way you ended as well. And especially love the, the fact that when you highlighted the, uh, the areas of unmet uh, needs that are uh, to be addressed in this uh, coming uh, decade or so, especially when you talked about the climate change and human dignity, uh, where I am sure, pretty sure that uh, the, uh, the knowledge of Indian ethos 
uh, that uh, I'm sure most of our students are already aware about can definitely make a difference uh, in coming days. Uh, we have some question uh, for you, sir. And uh, I would like to begin uh, with uh, one of the questions that I was uh, uh, thinking about from last uh, several months. During this pandemic, uh, we got an opportunity to interact with a lot of lawyers and practitioners uh, from the industry. And uh, most of them have said the common thing that uh, in India, especially, that uh, they have uh, uh, always been away from the technological breakthroughs, uh, at least till now. And uh, as my understanding tells me that in past uh, three or four decades, most of the entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, great uh, institutions have emerged because of te uh, technology, technology breakthrough. So uh, which is the technology breakthrough that you are uh, eyeing at in the future that will change the landscape of law? I think with law, you know what? Artificial intelligence is actually an interesting area for the law. But let me tell you in what context. Artificial intelligence enables data to be gathered very quickly and analysed. So within a, a huge population and very diverse cultural set that you have in India, you are able with artificial intelligence to connect to what are the emerging needs in particular provinces, in particular towns, in particular areas, what are people coming up with, what are their legal hurdles, then the law can jump on it. The lawyers can jump on it, the policy people can jump on it, the academics can say, hang on a second, we're noticing a particular region that has people who are coming up with agricultural innovations. Let's make sure around that region we have the best agricultural trained lawyers. Um, and let's also partner as part of entrepreneurship with funders who are good friends of the law firms, who are good friends of the innovators, and then the lawyers become part of that supply chain. And I think from I should congratulate the IT community in India because their level of innovation is equivalent to Silicon Valley. I can say that because we're looking at a number of technologies out of India for the world. Um, so there's plenty of smart people in your backyard. Uh, next question that I uh, am getting from one of my colleagues is that, uh, uh, which are the five skills uh, which, uh, that you uh, want uh, the law students, uh, especially who are in the final years uh, of uh, degree program to focus on uh, in order to uh, address any entrepreneurial opportunity and make most of it. Okay, number one, know your law. Know your legal cases really well. Um, number two, um, be very technical. I can tell you from legal adversarial negotiations the person that always wins is the person who understands the legislation yeah and the person who understands the subject matter that's being discussed Indeed. the person that doesn't win is the person who's on a limited budget whether they're big firm small firm and uses bully tactics um what the third thing uh, network. Develop your network. Now, I don't mean running around to a thousand meetings. During law school, you often interact with friends who are non lawyers. Yeah. You often interact with friends who've got some interesting ideas. Maybe they're crazy. I should say that a lot of lawyers become entrepreneurs too. So there may be some crazy people at your school. <laughs> 
um, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Um, the last thing is, if, if that's the last, I'm not sure, four or five, um, to be lateral thinking. Lateral thinking is really important. So if somebody says, oh, I've got this, um, uh, this 3D, um, what do I call it, virtual tour of my home state for tourists. Yeah. Fantastic. I said to them, you mean people can can log on, pay, view what the streets are like, the build? Yes, yes, yes. I said, I've got a customer for you, but it's not tourists. And they said, who? Human resource companies from multinationals that want to recruit executives to come and work in your area. They're often, they don't take the job because they're, partner or their children say oh mom dad i don't want to go there i don't know anything about it it's really weird i don't know whereas through virtual reality you can sell to, to the family so that's that's the lateral thinking side um yeah. and also have have diverse relationships and try different things that's probably the fifth one Uh, yeah. Uh, our next question that I have is that uh, since you have a very vast experience uh, in uh, mentoring and guiding uh, the budding entrepreneurs all over the world, uh, can you share uh, any particular instance uh, when you guided uh, a very fresh uh, graduate from a law school uh, regarding one law startup? Uh, I believe uh, that could uh, become an anecdote for all of our students. To, uh, to really pay attention to certain important points. Um, okay, so the, the challenge with um, mentoring is to, to what's known as to know yourself, know who you are. That's really hard because we get bombarded with Oh, you're not good enough unless you wear this. You're not good enough unless you look like that. You're not. You know, so we get bombarded and it makes us weak. So when you know yourself and in law, you we're very strong characters. You find out then what is your passion? What do you like to do within the law? If you know what that is, if it's social justice, if it's small business, if it's intellectual property, go and get some experience with the leaders in the space through referral, even if it's voluntary for a couple of weeks in the beginning. Then come up with something they're missing, something that you see they're missing in how they do things. So, one of the students, said, oh, I, I, I did an internship at a law firm and it was a case about, it was a service agreement for supplying steel, which, you know, was pretty boring, but nobody asked the question about, tell me about the company that you're dealing with and tell me about the company that you are, the client, because that way you can configure your legal agreements to better meet the risk and liability. So this person developed a template for the law firm, which said, right, when we've got a new client, we have to understand their business. We have to go and do a half day lecture, one hour lecture from the technical people and from leadership. So we understand their, their business, their mindset. Then when they come to us with an agreement, we say, ah, yes, yes, I got it. You can deliver faster, cheaper, and more targeted service. And then what happens is that you have a closer relationship yeah. with the client and everyone loves a close relationship with the client. Exactly. All right. So uh, uh, I, I hope uh, our students have understood that, that what uh, Dr. Chris was talking about was an important uh, stage in the entrepreneurship and that is uh, gap need identification and uh, I'm sure uh, 
there are plenty of gaps like that especially in the coming days uh, when we already are experiencing a very changing kind of uh, like one of the terms that was used by dr chris in our uh, brief conversation before uh, this lecture and that was a shape shifting times that we are experiencing right now is uh, something that we all have to be alert and uh, we have to observe very keenly especially when we are looking at uh, uh, making most of these opportunities by realizing these gaps and coming up with an idea that through which you can provide the services to the people out there uh, i have uh, one of my you know uh, colleagues uh, uh, who would like to ask a question tanmay uh, you could please uh... absolutely sir regard sir first of all uh, so since you mentioned about artificial intelligence sir i would just uh, put this one question to you and uh, uh, have your views on that uh, that uh, could it help in boosting the justice delivery system as well as the registration of intellectual property uh, some things that are already uh, can be uh, lodged as certain codes by by the artificial intelligence directly so could that help the whole justice delivery system and the whole mechanisms uh, as per your knowledge in the uh, international practices Thank you, Tanmay. Very, very good question. That would be a great service for both the international uh, community as well as your national community, because there's so much time wasted and inefficiency that what you are proposing would make a substantial difference. And not only that, but there's also a lot of money. that can be directed to that initiative so um i deal with a lot of financiers and and they've got so much money they don't know what to do with it they can't put it in apartments because no one's buying apartments stock markets all over the place they're looking for ideas like yours get a group of people around get a group of technical people and just run with it so it is very very important justice needs to work faster and there is no reason other than technical for it not working faster and it will also provide confidence to entrepreneurs and their advisors when they want to do something and they're not sure so let's just say you want to do something in afghanistan or china or somalia where do you start whereas an ai system that could give you that information quickly would be very helpful uh om uh, would you like to ask uh, the question yeah yeah so i have few questions from students basically and they are asking as to uh, uh basically they are asking as how much experience do you think a law student should have before initiating career as a legal entrepreneur now that question i believe because has been asked in the context uh, of developing countries basically like where it is not so easy to in, become a legal entrepreneur just after your uh, five year graduation right so that is uh, uh, the context wherein the students are asking this question how much experience do you think a law student should have before initiating career as legal entrepreneur it's like asking a crazy person how how much sanity do you need before you start a business zero what you need remember that slide that the the second slide or the one with the one about the entrepreneurs with the brain um, i i omitted to ex- to explain that word entheos which is a greek word it means that you are so excited you feel as though you're outside your body lawyers become very good entrepreneurs not a problem like anything it's it's about those those the, those word sets you believe if you've got an idea and you can self validate you think yes definitely it, it's needed um you're a little bit hard nosed you you it's a big audacious goal what you need to do is to find people around you who can help you because you you might say well on my own 
I can't, I, I don't know where to start. You need to find a few people, the school, your university, your school of law might have people come and speak to us. The, the crazy student amongst you will call us or send, send us an email and saying, I want to do get some work experience with you. Help me. I've got some great ideas. Help me. That's that's the stuff that you need. It's that level of energy which doesn't follow the rules to get that level of excitement is not rule based. What is rule based is is what comes after it, which is what your legal training will do. Um, so there are incubators. If there are any incubators that you're associated with, if not, I'm happy to refer you to some where you start to meet people, sitting on meetings, find out how things work. Um, we're happy to do some mentoring for students from the school as well. It would be funny if there were some academics that wanted mentoring, but we get offered that too. So it's a mindset. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a mindset. It's not a fixed rule. You know, it's if you're um, passionate, you're eighty percent there. Uh, definitely. Uh, another question which I have got from, uh, which I have received from the student is, uh, I believe he is from a specialized uh, IPR specialization, and because you were continuously pointing towards the IPR laws throughout your uh, session. Uh, he says that uh, he is asking whether uh, IPR related laws, if mastered correctly, pave inroads to legal entrepreneurship and also be part of management of growing company is, uh, companies. Is it possible? Absolutely. And that's what differentiates the good IP lawyer. Um, when you are able to look at where the product is going, which markets, look at what registered and unregistered IP exists in those markets, then you can create a fence around your IP or your client's IP. So unless you have that, and it, it, most of it is mined with a bit of structure, you know, you're just a very normal average IP lawyer. So the IP lawyer always looks at the market and what is registered because you have to do a comparison of the two. So, for example, in Australia, in IT, there's only two lawyers I'd go to, two IP lawyers. Out of a thousand, two. That's not a lot. <laughs> America, in IT, maybe three in San Francisco. Five in New York, that's it. One in Seattle. That's it. Because they focus on those things. Thank you. All right. So another question which is asked, which has been asked by my colleague is uh, whether, uh, so he has come up with a, uh, she has come up with a context for the question. Uh, entrepreneurship as an expression of the creative impulse and New creation and changing market condition, change business and commercial relationship, and create unimaginable risks and dangers. How this Im imbalance can be addressed properly? What are the various ways uh, through which we can address this these imbalances properly? I think what your prime minister is doing seeks to address the imbalance. Now, but the how is that you need to have, and this is where lawyers are brilliant. Lawyers have excellent structure, a bit like engineers, although lawyers are more flexible than engineers, believe it or not, because when an engineer builds a bridge, it, it can't fall down, whereas a lawyer can create variations and has lots more flexibility. So the key for a lawyer is to make sure that whatever they do, that, that they put a very strong level of diligence and detail into what they're doing in how they describe an opportunity. When they deal with other parts of the supply chain, such as product development, 
such as people. They validate their CVs, so human resource. They also look at customers. In fact, this is an area which is most interesting to us at GOC. We, when we're helping people develop products or services, we go to the customers and we ask the customer if this product is developed, if it has the following attributes, features, if it has the following benefits, would you buy it? We get them to commit non-binding to a purchase. That then tells us what needs to be done to be developed in a very clear manner. There's still room for variation, but when you're getting a product out, you have to make sure you get it out on time. So the law has a very particular role here, but due diligence and commercial um, honesty and, and diligence is very important as well. And it, it's doable, it's very doable because we buy innovative products all the time. Therefore, it does happen. Thank you. Right. Uh, most probably this is the last question. Uh, how can young lawyers play active role in social enterprises, which you pointed out, without compromising the, uh, their financial security, especially in developing countries? So that is uh, one question, if you can throw light on that. That social enterprises is a big area. There are big, um, the innovation will come from two areas. One from big firms that are investing in the space and two moms and dads and innovators at home in their village who come up with innovation. To avoid financial compromising, work with the big national and international organizations that can pay you, but also have a focus for social enterprises, commercialization. So the short answer again to repeat is that there are big organizations looking at this space, get close to them, and they will ensure you don't have financial shortcomings. So yeah. those are the those are those were the questions which I, have been asked by the students. So oh, I'm I done think, with uh, question and answer session. We can uh, we can can we have uh, any question from uh, one of the, any of the panelists? We have several faculty members over here. If they would like to ask question related to entrepreneurship and law, please uh, ask. Okay. I have one question myself. If yeah. I can ask. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so we uh, we are observing uh, this uh, trend in India right now that we, there are various uh, uh, legal uh, various platforms which are coming up with uh, legal education per se, right? And I'm observing that various of our students itself are part uh, they themselves are part of this particular legal education platform. And uh, this one uh, to name few, there are other platforms like Law Octopus, and then you have got. Uh, legit quest also right and law corners also so you have uh, we have these uh, number of platforms which are emerging over the period of time now uh, don't you think that uh, uh, it's uh, mushrooming like anything and uh, in emerging in this particular manner uh, they are effectively uh, deviating or uh, distracting the students from their primary task of knowing law reading things instead of just uh, coming up on platforms and uh, posting uh, a very uh, superficial ideas uh, ideas about law per se then giving that particular time on reading books and using this five years uh, five year time uh, of their graduation per se and there are various trend uh, in adding add on to add on to that uh, we have got this trend that uh, 
the students are coming up with uh, interview rounds also for various uh, academicians, the young academicians. To what extent we at this point of time are uh, can can say that uh, the young academician per se or for that matter young student are in that particular stage where they can talk about such in-depth uh, knowledge or, or aspects of law per se. Isn't it distracting them from uh, the primary task that what they need to do, the reading per se, during their first three, five, four years of graduation? That's a, it's a very good question. There is a trend in um, the UK, America, Australia, for people to get online and just download template agreements, do the transactions very quickly, walk away. That's a big danger because it makes the legal profession um, not as prestigious and dependable. I would say that as a young student, you must understand the principles and you must be able to apply the principles in your cases, from, from your cases that you read and the legislation. Try and interact with the community, whether it's legislation, policy writing, recommendations, get involved in research with your academics. That's a good thing to do as well, because the winners are always the ones who has the depth of legal knowledge and also commercial knowledge. But I have seen barristers who are junior up against Queen's Councils, our senior category, and they eat them alive because they know the technical issues. So if you want to be a judge in the future or a professor at school, you must know the technicals. Uh, I, I can't, and, and that was never told to us as well at school, but it's annoying because there's lots of reading, but you must, and, and you must maybe even with your friends, discuss, challenge the principles. Um, if you have local judges who can come to the school and explain to you the principle, really important as well. Uh, but uh, to be honest, there is an international push for more legal templates to be used in commerce. The danger is that lawyers then just become marketing people. And you'll find that only 2% of the legal profession will do well. And the rest, you know, will, will be downgraded substantially. So I think the law as a institutional pillar of society must always remain strong and guide society, not become a commercial tool of the click and download. Um, so if you're strong in that, if you remain strong, um, you will proceed very far. Now, if you're an entrepreneur and you produce a bunch of precedents, you make a lot of money. Uh, so any other question? I think uh, uh, we have come to the end of uh, the session. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, this has been one of the most interesting sessions that we have uh, conducted in this uh, lecture series because uh, Dr. Chris uh, not only presented the topic, but he presented the topic in such a clinical way in imparting understanding on the entrepreneurship in the law as not just uh, from the perspective of how lawyers or law students can uh, uh, look at entrepreneurial opportunities in the future, but also to uh, address the uh, the uh, the legal uh, you know queries and legal uh, challenges that are faced by entrepreneurs in the world, and then seeking commercialization opportunities out of it, which is also one of the biggest areas that can uh, generate uh, revenue for uh, lawyers, law firms, and various practitioners who are practicing in this field. So. Uh, I think it is uh, an understatement to say that this was merely a presentation. In fact, uh, it was more of a uh, uh, an eye opener, and uh, you uh, summed up uh, the the vast uh, you know area 
uh, uh, such as big as this uh, in such a short span of time, which itself is a testament of the fact that how experienced and how clear your ideas are uh, uh, as, an, as a professional mentor and as a coach uh, to the budding entrepreneurs all over the world. So on behalf of Jagran Lake City University School of Law, I am extremely uh, thankful to Dr. Chris uh, Sotizopoulos for, uh, first of all, accepting our invitation so kindly and uh, accepting our request uh, to address uh, the students on this important and pertinent topic of entrepreneurship and the law. And uh, I must say that, uh, that this should be just a beginning of our association with Dr. Chris uh, and uh, that I am sure many events uh, and many programs in which uh, we can collaborate with you and the institutions that you represent. I am also thankful uh, to our Honorable Chancellor Sri Hari Mohan Gupta, our Honorable Co-Chancellor Sri Abhishek Mohan Gupta, and our Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. Anup Sarup, uh, who always encourages us and motivates us to have such stimulating and uh, thought-provoking uh, discourse uh, in this uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm extremely thankful uh, to our uh, Dean, Professor Dr. Yogendra Shivasto, who has been the guiding torch in, uh, to our team uh, for organizing such uh, great events. Uh, I'm extremely thankful to my fellow program leaders and faculty members at the JD School of Law for uh, supporting and uh, cooperating in order to uh, organize uh, this lecture. And uh, most importantly, I'm uh, really thankful uh, to our beloved students who uh, attended this session. And I'm sure you have many takeaways from uh, today's session that you will definitely implement in days to come in your career. I'm also thankful uh, to our uh, ERP head, uh, Mr. Kubeer Kedare, for providing the technical support uh, to conduct uh, this session and uh, to the entire team of uh, Jagan Lake City University for uh, being extremely cooperative in organizing this lecture successfully. So uh, with this, uh, we come to the end of uh, the lecture. And once again, I am uh, thankful to Dr. Chris for sparing your value and time to guide our students. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the very best of success and uh, a continuing relationship. Sure, um, sure. And I remember my times at law school very well. Yes, sir. Thank you so much and uh, have a good Thank day. You, sir.